Bristol Myers is at its 52 week low. Now this is a company that has hammered down nearly 40% over the last 12 months. Now things are getting interesting. It does yield around 6% on a forward looking basis and does seem to be incredibly undervalued and a great buying opportunity. Now, in terms of why this company is down, well, in their latest quarterly earnings, they did in fact beat on the revenue. However, they did post quite a significant quarterly loss. But as we are about to find out today, this was a one-off and isn't expected over future quarters. And we can see one of the things that they are looking to do is save around 1.5 billion by the end of 2025. Now, in terms of this company, we can see the dividend score does look to be 70. So we do get that safe score, which is always good to see. And they did increase that dividend in December by above the inflationary rate of 4%. So again, another positive sign for a company that does currently yield at that 6% level. Now, one thing that we always like to see is when this dividend safety score gets reaffirmed. And in actual fact, that did happen just in May. So not too long ago, a dividend cut does look to be unlikely for this company. Now, in terms of a recession, if we are bound to have one in the shorter term, what we can see from the 0709 Great Recession, BMY in fact maintained the dividend. Now, they didn't increase it, but they also didn't cut it. They did have negative 21% recession sales. Now, bear in mind, this is below the average of the S&P at negative 12. However, they did significantly outperform the S&P in terms of return, negative 32. S&P itself returning negative 55. Now, one thing we'd like to look at is the growth of that dividend. And what we can see, as we just mentioned, above inflationary increase last December, nice high single digit over the last five years. And at a minimum over the last 20 years, with their nice yield, they have been increasing it in line with inflation. In terms of the number of years, well, actually, it is 17 years where they have been increasing the dividend, but they have been paying a dividend without a single reduction for the last 53 years. As always, very importantly, one of the things that we do look at is dividend yield theory. Now, what it does state, a company is undervalued when the current yield sits above the five year average. So we have a severe undervaluation signal six versus three point one five. Bear in mind as well, this is the highest yield they have offered over the last five years. Now, the forward P as well, when you remove the one off item, it does sit at 5.9 and that is also below the five year average. So a double undervaluation signal. In fact, in today's episode, we get a triple undervaluation signal as the healthcare sector P does sit much, much higher. Also, bear in mind, we don't look at any one of these models, however, in isolation. As always, very important, the free cash flow payout below 50% is what we want to see for the biotech industry. Pretty much from 2018, it has been below that consistently. Pretty low as well expected over the next 12 months at 35%. So we can already see and anticipate a nice increase to the dividend at a bare minimum in line with inflation. Very important as well, free cash flow. We want increasing consistent free cash flows over longer term. Pretty much what we get with this company for BMY, 158 to 611. And the expectation is for the upward trend to continue over the next 12 month period. When we look at these sales growth in a percentage format, three to 7%, now we will look at the numbers in detail shortly, but we can see pretty inconsistent, although on average you would expect at least in line with inflation. The last two years, however, very poor in terms of that top line movement. And when we do look at it numerically, we can see it grow around three times over the last 10 years, but it has remained fairly stagnant over the last four. In terms of looking at the ROIC, which for me is a very important metric, Above 25% for biotechs, for me personally, 10% or more for all the companies I analyze. Reason for this, we want to gain essential faith that management are able to effectively allocate their capital. It has looked okay over the last 10 years. 2019, 2020, not the greatest, but even over the last three in the low double digits is still something that I can personally accept. Then we look at the margins on the operating side. It does essentially straddle around that minimum 25%. Some years it's okay, some years a little bit subpar, 2023 at 19%. In terms of the free cash flow, well, we love to see this from 2017, 20% plus, and in fact been increasing over the longer term. Then we move on to the net debt to EBITDA, very important metric here, as this does correlate to dividend safety and balance sheet strength. Below 1.5 for biotech, and it was pretty much straddling around that over the last three years. We do know over the next 12 months, it is anticipated to increase significantly, but as we are about to find out from their investor presentation, this is something they are looking to reduce over the next few years. 
Now heading back to the actual company, the historical performance, now we do get just one buy rating in today's episode from Seeking Alpha, we get a double hold from the other two analysts, Forward P, now as we mentioned, and we're going to touch upon this soon, it is look very skewed due to the one-off, but it will come down very, very significantly. And in terms of the performance, well, negative 39 over the last 12 months. Over the last 10 years, if you have been a shareholder, even with reinvesting the dividend, which would be marginally better performance, you still would be down over the period. And we can, in fact, see all-time highs around $81 nearly two years ago. And we can pretty much see that is double the current trading price today. So in terms of the top line revenue growth that we do like to see, as we mentioned, three times growth over the last 10 years. However, when we do look at it on a graphical basis, we can really see 2014 to 2019, there was some nice consistent growth even into 2020. But since then, over the last four years, it has remained fairly flat, something that we will need to consider within our valuation model later on. In terms of the bottom line net income, well, what story to be told? 2 billion in 2014, 8 billion in 2023, so four times growth. But unfortunately, it is fairly inconsistent. We do see the drop in 2020. And whilst it has recovered, again, there isn't that consistency that maybe we would like to see. Something just to think about as we do move on in the episode today. When we look at the health of the company, always very important, total cash versus total debt. It has been increasing now 7.4 billion in December 2014, 9.7 billion in that latest quarterly report. And we can see over longer term that cash balance has been increasing quite a nice amount sitting on that balance sheet just under 10 billion. But as always in isolation, that number honestly doesn't really mean anything, which is why we compare it as always to their total debt. And what we can see, it has increased rapidly from 7.8 billion in 2014 to 57 billion. So that is one of the reasons why we saw that net debt to EBITDA level pretty high. Something again, as we said, management are focusing on decreasing and we can clearly see the period. In fact, this is split down the middle as we can see. The last five years, 2019 to 2023, very high. Previous to that though, it was very low and pretty much consistently same. So again, lots to consider here with this company. Some good, some that we will need to factor into our margin of safety as well. The next thing that we want to look at is how have they performed against analyst estimates over the last four quarters to give us confidence about the forward looking data. Now the more recent one, they were in line in terms of the earnings per share. Previous two they did beat and they miss in the fourth quarter Q2 2023. So you could argue a 75% track record of at least being in line or beating analyst targets. What we do want to point out over the next three quarters, they are anticipating a decrease to the earnings per share year on year. And as we said, when you remove that one off item and we do look towards the next full year, December 2025, the forward P is anticipated to drop right below six. So again, whether or not you are happy with their estimates, whether or not you in fact have that confidence. We then move on to the valuation grade and underlining metrics. Now they do get an A. So one thing to bear in mind here, while we do get an F here for the P on a non-gap basis, when we do look towards the essential removal of the one-off item, this will be sitting around six, which we can in fact see will be significantly lower than the sector median of 19. So in fact, trading at a discount in terms of this valuation method. And when you do look at the majority of those other valuation methods, like the price to cash flow, the price to sales, what we do see in terms of a theme here is that BMY is trading at a large discount. Now, whether or not that is warranted, you could argue it's at a discount for a fair reason because there doesn't have the growth profitability or others that maybe we see in the sector. Again, that is what we are coming on to now. So growth grade, they get an F. Now, year on year, negative 1%, sector median around 7%. Forward looking pretty much flat as we can see the sector median, nice high single digit. And when we go across to one of the most important metrics we like to see, the earnings per share over the next five years is anticipated to drop 5% year on year. Others in the sector around 11%. So maybe on a valuation they get an A, but we can clearly see the growth does look incredibly poor. In terms of the profitability, well, we're looking at an A plus now, so that is nice to note. Gross profit margin, very high, 76%, a lot better than the sector median. And then when we look at the net income margin, we can see, again, it is skewed due to that one-off item, negative 14. But in general, we can see the sector didn't have the greatest performance on a trailing 12-month basis either. The other thing that we want to point out there, cash from operations is significantly high, just under 14 billion, whilst we have others in the sector, negative 16. So a quick conclusion for this part of the analysis, one buy rating from Seeking Alpha, a double hold, an A on the valuation, F on growth, with an A plus on profitability. 
Now, one thing we want to point out is, is there a general theme? Is BMY just in isolation very poor? Or is that something we see in the pharmaceutical industry? So we're comparing it to a few others that you can see here. Some big names that we have also covered on the channel. So this includes reinvesting those dividends, negative 35% over the last 12 months, the worst performing one of two that were in fact negative. When we expand this over the last five years, we can see again one of the worst performing marginally up 4%. And when we look over the last 10 years, in fact, you would be up positive, very marginal with just 12%. If you factor in inflation, you would in fact have lost your purchasing power over the period. So something to bear in mind, but as we always like to remind you that past performance is not an indicator of future performance. Now, the result here will be very obvious, but again, we do like to highlight the fact that if you're not confident that a company will outperform the S&P over the longer term, then you could consider looking at a low cost ETF. For example, over the last 12 months, significant disparity between these two assets. As we see, BMY down negative 35%, the S&P up 26 Over the last five years, again, the same story to be told. And over the last 10, again, no surprises here, significant outperformance by the S&P. So something just to bear in mind. Now, before we move on, just to let you know, we have released our latest free weekly article where we look at 18 undervalued dividend kings, and you do get a free spreadsheet along with this. If you want access to this or any other articles, they are all completely free. So do click on that pinned comment below and you can start reading straight away. Next thing we're looking at insider ownership. Now 0.09%, very, very small. We see the side is selling 1.15 million over the last year. And again, over the same period, we do see some insider buying, but very minimal in comparison. Main thing that we really want to point out from here, there has been no insider buying or selling. In fact, you'd have to go all the way to quarter four of 2023, where we actually see insider buying. And for any insider selling, where well, you would have to go back nearly a year ago today. Whether or not you believe any of this is bullish or bearish, again, the information is there. And for those that do want to see who these insiders are, we can clearly see here it was the CEO on the 5th of December 23 who did buy 2,000 shares. In fact, he also bought another tranche of shares on the 28th of November. We then move on to institutional ownership. Now, this is just above 76%. 8.4 billion worth of sales over the last 12 months, significant amount more buying over the last 12 months. And also interestingly, over the more recent quarter, a lot more buying than selling. And the same can be said for the previous quarter as well. So interestingly, over the more recent period, we see insider buying and we also see institutionals buying more than they are selling. So whether or not you believe this is bullish, we would always say, do your own due diligence before executing on these shares. Now, a few things we want to point out from their latest investor presentation. The first one, they talk about advanced pipeline, which is always going to be good. You want to see more items come out that not only help the public, but also do help increase their top line revenue. And we can see they have multiple regulatory approvals and some clinical development milestones. Now, you can go onto their website if you want to see more information about their pipeline. And as we can see, they have 55 compounds in developments with over 40 plus disease areas being studied. Now, in terms of looking at how far along these are, well, there are always three phases with these things before getting to the regulatory stage. And we can see in terms of phase one, this is the initial stages. There are a lot of different areas where they are looking at. And again, if this is something you are interested on, you can go onto their website. For those that want to see the more recent in terms of phase three, this is, as we can see, still quite a lot in the pipeline there that they do believe over the longer term will help in terms of their top line increases. In terms of looking at their capital allocation, something I really like to draw your attention to, cash flow from operations now very inconsistent year on year. But what we talked about, again, we just want to show you where we saw this. They plan to pay around 10 billion of debt over the next two years. Always a great sign. And we can see as well, they had at this point around 5 billion in share repurchase authorizations left at the end of this more recent quarter. So again, lots of interesting things here to know. Also business development as well. They have completed some acquisitions. So it does look like it is moving in the right direction. And as we're about to come on to, you maybe will start to be able to understand why this has a lot of upside over the future. Finally, before we move into the valuation, in terms of their full year 2024, they're anticipating low single digits in terms of that revenue. Again, a low single digit if you do exclude FX rates and their earnings per share, as we can see, this is fairly low, which is driving that very high current forward PE as it does include a negative 6.73 impact from those closed transactions. Now, moving into the valuation for this company, we get to an intrinsic value of just under $52. Now, we'll explain how we get this. And as always, you can grab a copy of this model by clicking on the pinned comment below. 
We use Graham's valuation where we have the stock ticker symbol. We put in the, all the inputs. Now, the market value currently just below $40. We do get to an intrinsic value of around $43. So there is that initial undervaluation signal. Now, the multiples valuation model isn't one that we're going to use today for BMY, but you can see if we did, it would come to a value of around $84. Right now, we don't believe any of these similar or comparable companies are in the same situation as BMY, but you can see again, if you were to include it, you could do the calculations to get to a different intrinsic value. We then have the dividend discount model. Now, the average growth of the dividend has been very nice, but what we are using here is a lot more conservative at 4%. Again, as we can clearly see here, a massive undervaluation signal. And then we have the DCF model here that we can see. Now we have used negative 4%, again, trying to be a lot more conservative. With that discount rate, we do get the present value of those future free cash flows. Add together with the cash, subtract total debt, get the equity value, divide by the shares outstanding. And as we can see here, that third and final undervaluation signal. So in terms of the intrinsic value, then it is just the average of these three models that you can see. In terms of the current price, well, just under 40, as we mentioned, but we always like to use a margin of safety at 10% and we execute on that if it meets our three golden criteria. Wide moat, strong financial metrics, good forward-looking data. If you believe that, well, look, it's about to $47. And then we keep going till it's near the current trading price. And in today's episode, we can see it isn't quite at that 25% MOS level yet, which is around that $39 mark, but it's sitting somewhere between 20 to 25%. Now, Wall Street themselves are very bullish on this in terms of the upside. They see 31%, their price target $52, so definitely believe it is one to consider for your portfolio. As always, let us know your thoughts in the comments below. Do you believe their pipeline will really help this company grow over the next few years, accelerating towards our intrinsic value that we've calculated, as well as Wall Street's forecast? Maybe this is one that's on the watch list if it comes even lower, or maybe the 6% yield is very attractive at a starting rate. As always, if you enjoyed today's episode, smash that like button, hit that subscribe and bell button. Let us know your thoughts below. And as always, we'll see you all on the next one.